Well, good afternoon. I wanted to mention a couple of things about the midterm. Nothing, nothing too long. Uh, just sort of a brief video, just to give you a couple of reminders and uh, suggestions as you're thinking through and working on the midterm. And before I do that, actually, I also wanted to mention that we are now at the point in the semester where we will. Let me let me get my book here, which is on a stack <laughs> underneath my desk. I should have prepped that better. Um, after we finish up with the midterm, we will be reading Perfect Example by John Porcellino. Now, remember, this is the old edition of the book, which is perfectly fine. It's the same as the new edition. Uh, this is the new edition of the book, which I actually just got in the mail last week, um, a perfect example. Either one is fine. It doesn't matter which one that you use. There's very little difference between them, except they do add page numbers in this newer edition, which is convenient. And he added a little bit more to the uh, biographical information at the back, but that's not a big deal. Um, but the rest of it's totally the same. So um, make sure to, uh, if you want to get a head start on paper four, uh, you know, at, which we'll be doing after we get done with the midterm, um, we're going to be using a uh, perfect example, the John Porcelino book for that. And again, it doesn't matter which, which edition of it you have, if you have the older edition that looks like this, or you have the newer edition that looks like that. But that is the book we're going to be reading uh, starting right here after the uh, after the midterm. So make sure you have a copy of it. Uh, and the, uh, if you have any questions, you know, let me know. The, the Harper Bookstore has copies. Um, there's plenty of used copies online, particularly of this older edition. Um, this one, there's a lot of uh, cheap used copies online. The new edition, I don't think, is, is that expensive either. I think it's, it's, it's a little more pricey than the old one was. It's 20 bucks. Um, but again, you can get the old one online if you haven't already done so. But make sure you have the book because that is the one we're focusing on with paper number four. Um, and uh, the same goes for the Solonin book because we're going to use that for paper number five. So this is the point in the semester where you want to make sure you've got both of the books because as we finish up with the midterm, that's what we're going to be focusing on in the fourth and the fifth paper as we, as we start doing these longer sort of research uh, topics on these assignments. But we're still finishing the midterm uh, and talking about the midterm. So let me let me just mention a couple of brief things about that and how I how I want you to focus on it, because as you've noticed, it's different, right? It's a, it's a narrative. Now it, it's the only assignment we did that's like this, and 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 there won't be any others. The, the other papers we do in the second half of the semester are, are like the first three that we did, where you're using sources and doing analysis. Um, but for this, uh, this assignment, the first part is pretty straightforward. It's asking you for four paragraphs about a particular friendship that you've had. Now, the reason I'm having you write a narrative about that is that I think it's a good summary, as I said in the last video, of the readings we did in the first half of the semester, all of which focus on that topic, right? Because we had, you know, uh, the Farwell story about Dybeck and his, his pr professor friend from Loyola. We had the uh, the story uh, from Harlan Ellison, you know, with the friendship between Gaspar and Billy in Paladin of the Lost Hour. And then, of course, we had the uh, the friendships that developed in the two Otto Binder stories. And these are the subjects that you all wrote about for the first three papers. So now, again, now, since we're in the middle of the semester, I want you to sort of take a, take a step back, you know, I think as I said in the last video, and think about some of those themes, but you now have the opportunity to write your own short narrative in the first part of this about a particular friendship that was significant to you. You do not have to quote from Cisneros. You don't have to quote from Cindy Crabb. Those were just there as models, and they're longer, obviously, than the, 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 um, the, the short response that you're doing. But I wanted you to see two essays that are specifically very directly on that theme of friendship. The, the stories we read are, are all on that theme as well. You know, but the Cisneros essay about her mom and the crab one about her friend Elliot are, are very much in the spirit of what I want you to do for the first part of the midterm. It's just telling that story and thinking about the things that you learn from this person, whether it's, uh, you know, someone within your family or, a, you know, a friend. That's why I gave you Cisneros, because it shows you how she has that kind of connection with her mom and that friendship with her mom, even though when she was younger, she clearly didn't understand her mom that well. But as she got older, they got closer and she understood her a lot better. Um, the Cindy Crabb is probably closer to the kind of essay that you would write if you're writing about a friend that you met in grammar school or, you know, in, in, in high school or maybe even here in college. Um, and so that's closer to that kind of an essay. Whereas the other one, this is Nero's, is more about a, a fr you know, a friendship formed with someone within your own family. And that's why I wanted you to see those two, because they're good models to kind of think about as you're uh, thinking about and, and finishing up the, uh, the midterm. Now, the other reason I've given you that topic is that those are themes that continue, particularly as we get into the John Porcelino book. In fact, the John Porcelino book, perfect example, is aside from the fact that, as I keep mentioning, it's set in Palatine and Hoffman Estates and Arlington Heights and that whole area around campus. 
Um, it also talks about these kind of bonds and friendships that he tries to develop as he's finishing up his senior year uh, at Hoffman High School and also going into that summer before he goes to college at Northern um, in the fall of 1986. And so that short essay about your own friend is a little bit of a preview about some of some of the themes that are going to come up in Perfect Example when we read that book for paper number four. So again, as I mentioned in the last video, I think of it as kind of a bridge taking us from the first half of the semester to the second half while also giving you a shorter assignment because I can imagine in your other classes you're probably getting swamped right now with other uh, fairly heavy-duty assignments. And so the way I structure all my classes is, as I said, we did a lot of heavy lifting in the weeks leading up to the midterm. And so now we can kind of step back and do something shorter because we've, did, we've done all these other papers. And then once we get out of the midterm, we'll go back, um, hopefully when your other classes have quieted down a little bit, and we'll be getting back into those other papers for the second half of the semester. Okay, so that's how I structure my classes so that I don't like the idea of, of giving you more heavy work on top of work you're probably already getting from classes where maybe all you have is a midterm and maybe all you have is a midterm and a final. With an English class like this, I've, I've got more flexibility where I can give you these shorter assignments as we go so that you're not just getting flooded with, with um, assignments all at once, at least from me. Okay, so that's why I sort of make the midterm shorter, as you can see, from, from what you might have in your other classes. Um, second part of the midterm is, is asking you to think ahead. And as I mentioned in the last video, you're not revising anything for the midterm. All you're doing is you're looking back at those first three papers and you're deciding which one that you're going to revise at the end of the semester. Because when we get to late April, early May, then you'll have an opportunity to go back to paper one, two, or three and revise the one that maybe was your weakest of those assignments. Um, so that's that's a sh even shorter. It's two paragraphs where you're telling me of those three papers, which one do you think you're actually going to revise? And one of the things you can focus on, not just for part two of this midterm assignment, but for the whole thing, because you're not using sources and because you're just writing two narratives about yourself, in the first case about your friend, and in the second half uh, about your writing, I do want you to pay particularly close attention to some of the grammar and style issues that I have mentioned, not only in some of these videos uh, and in the grammar and style sheet that's on Blackboard, I always put that right underneath the most recent assignment, um, but also on your paper. So again, I'm hoping that you're reading the comments that I write on your papers as you get them back, uh, because that way you're gonna know what to fix for the next paper. So when you get a paper back from me, please don't wait you know, until the end of the semester to take a look at it uh, when we actually get to the revision assignment, because all of these papers build on the one that came before it. So when I give you the paper back uh, and I give you those comments, I want you to see what worked and I want you to see what didn't work in the assignment that you just finished so that you can then make improvements on the next assignment that you're working on. So part of that is looking at, uh, you know, issues like spelling are not so much a, a problem typically uh, in English 102, although I did notice a lot of you we're misspelling Gaspar from, from Paladin of the Lost Hour. It's it's G-A-S-P-A-R, -A -A not G-A-S-P-E-R. Okay, so that was something that came up a lot. And you do want to be careful. Make sure you're spelling the names of characters correctly. Make sure you're spelling names of your of your authors correctly. One typo is, you know, not an issue, but if it's consistently wrong throughout the paper, um, it's something that's, it's indicating that you need to go back and maybe check it over one more time before you send it in. Just some of the, so some of those little mistakes are not there. Um, and with that in mind, I want to give you just a couple of things to really look for with this midterm, these short essays um, that are easy mistakes to ignore, especially if you're sort of finishing your paper quickly and, and maybe not uh, reading it over carefully uh, before you send it in. So try to take your time, read it over. And so here's some things I want you to pay attention to. I, I wrote these up on my little, my dry erase board here. I'm going to have to push my desk chair back so you can see it. So first off, um, when you're writing these two short responses, be really careful about any sentence fragments or run-on sentences. Now, you may not have any issues with that. That's really dependent upon what kind of comments I put on, on papers one, two, or three. So if I mentioned to you that you had some sentence fragments, run-on sentences, take a look through those papers and see what some of the common issues are. Okay, What are some of the things that I've been pointing out to you? here in the first half of the semester. So in other words, you know, what kind of errors are coming up? And by errors, what I mean are these grammatical issues, sentence problems. Um, you may not have that many. You may not, you may have uh, typos that just come up because, you know, you may not have read over the last version of the paper carefully before you turned it in. But you might be having a pattern. There might be like, you might have more fragments, you might have more run-on sentences. None of those are difficult to fix. 
uh, in a lot of cases, it just takes practice and, and again, kind of reading over a final draft carefully just to see if you see those errors creeping in. But because you're not using sources for the midterm and because you're writing two narrative, short narrative response essays, this is a good opportunity to slow down and to look for those errors. So if on your previous papers up to this point, I've said, be careful of r fragments, you know, which are incomplete sentences, or be careful of run-ons, which are multiple sentences that have been all put together into one, as I mentioned in, I think, a video a few weeks ago, um, and don't have any punctuation, watch for those and make that part of the thing that you're practicing in the midterm is just because you don't have to worry about uh, so sources and citations for this. You can focus purely on your sentences and on your style. Related to that also here for number two, um, actually, I didn't get to, let me, let me get to number two in a second. I forgot to mention paragraph structure. One of the other things you may have noticed in the first um, part of the semester is um, as I'm reading your papers, I'm also looking at the structure of your paragraphs. And I, I try to encourage you to be as concise as possible. Um, don't forget the lessons you learned in high school or in English 101 about topic sentences. Every one of your paragra paragraphs should have one main idea, one concept that ties it all together. And so if you're starting to get into other details and other examples and other quotations in a really long paragraph and you find that your paragraph is ending up being half a page or, uh, well, maybe maybe a little longer than that, maybe almost a page long, you're going to want to break it up because that means that you're trying to put too many ideas into one short paragraph and break them up, slow, slow it down so that you have those distinct ideas um, in the body of the paper. And again, that varies. If you've seen me commenting on your paragraph length in the previous papers, then um, you'll know that because in my comments, I will have said, oh, break this down or split up this paragraph or move this around because I do a lot of those kind of structural uh, edits, partly so that when we get to the end of the semester, you can do a revision on one of these papers and, and be happy with it because so, so you'll have a lot of detailed um, uh, examples to work from in terms of my edits. Okay. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention with these sorts of edits is an error that I always tend to see around midterms, and I think it's because, um, I, and again, it has nothing to do with these being online classes either, because this happens when I'm in my regular in-person classes, but I do notice sometimes around the midterm, um, some odd things will start happening with papers. So a lot, of, a lot of things that I know you already know how to do start falling by the wayside, because again, I'm sure you have a lot of other work to do uh, for your other classes. Uh, but I noticed in paper number three uh, that there's been some issues with apostrophes. Now, apostrophes, I, I didn't really notice this in papers number one and most of paper number two, but paper number three has been, uh, there's been some issues with apostrophes where people are either not using them at all or using them in, in places where they're not correct. So I want to do a brief reminder for you of how to use the apostrophe. Now, uh, and I have it here on my, my board, of course. Um, with apostrophes, in there's really only two places you're ever going to use them. They're used for possession and they're used to show con uh, contractions, right? So here's an example. Uh, I enjoyed reading Binder's stories. So Binder's possessive, those are his stories. It's apostrophe S. I read a lot of paper number three where there were no apostrophes at all. That's an issue. That is going to... Now, I didn't, I didn't give anyone like a failing grade for that if that was, you know, the major issue with the paper. But if there's a lot of those mistakes, I, I will start grading down because that's, that's an error that... Um, Think, think of it in terms of um, when you're in your profession at some point and maybe your boss asks you to write up some sort of report or asks you to write up some kind of letter, whatever it might be at the, at the profession you're going into. If that piece of writing that you do is filled with a lot of those kinds of errors, no apostrophes, sentences that are not totally complete, your boss is going to say, what's going on? I, you know, I asked you to do this. So um, you need to be careful of editing those things now uh, because, you know, your boss will probably not help you fix those kind of apostrophe issues or problems, especially if it's just something that you left out. So be careful of that. If you notice that I was correcting a lot of those kind of typos in the last couple of papers, for this essay, for the midterm, because these are shorter assignments, really try to focus on editing carefully to correct those kind of mistakes to catch those typographical errors. Maybe have somebody else read it over before you send it in to me uh, and take your time with it. Because again, I had a lot of papers last time uh, or in some, to some extent in paper number two as well, where people were just leaving out apostrophes altogether or they were putting in the wrong place. Again, in English, really, there's only two places to use apostrophes. It's for in possession. And then also here, I didn't know Binder 
um, wrote so many stories, didn't, you know, did not is a contraction. So the apostrophe is used there to indicate the fact that the letter O has been removed from the word not. Uh, again, those are not major issues, but if there's enough of them, they prevent you from really communicating your ideas effectively to the reader because those become distracting, those kind of errors. And I guarantee you, you're not going to be able to catch every single one of them. If you, if you read the update from last Friday, you know that I spent most of the last three weeks when I wasn't grading papers, um, editing and proofreading the final version of the new book that my, my colleague Brandon Costello and I have coming out. Uh, later this spring. And that just means that the publisher sends you the, the manuscript. It's all electronic now. It's not a paper manuscript anymore. Uh, and then you have to do one last read through in which you index everything. So if you've ever wondered how where indexes come from in a book, the authors do them. I mean, we, we did the index for the book. And uh, we also had to check for any last errors. And this book has already been through, I don't know how many edits, and we still found typos. It's just It just happens. You know, that's why when you're publishing a book, there's different editors that have to look at it and have to go through it. So you're not going to catch every single typographical error. Again, I guarantee you, I just finished up, like I said, proofreading a 350-page book, and we found typos that we didn't think would be there because we edited it so carefully right before, at the last fall when we were doing the other steps in this process. Um, so don't feel bad if you have a couple of typos. It happens, and they're easy to fix. But if there's a consistent uh, number of errors where there's no apostrophes or there's just a lot of run-on sentences... Those are things you can identify more easily because if, if there's a lot of those types of errors, just give it one more read through. You know, give yourself enough time before a paper is due that you can kind of read through some of those errors and catch them before you turn them turn them into me. Uh, uh, and if you have any questions, obviously let me know. Now, the other thing I want to mention, and again, I'm, I'm moving ahead a little bit in my imagination here to, to paper number four. Um, as we get closer to paper number four, and um, again, you're, you're still working on the midterm, but we'll, another thing I'm going to recommend for the next uh, second half of the semester, as I keep dispensing advice here today, um, try to start the next paper assignment uh, as soon as you can. You know, as I've said before, um, you have a lot of other work, I'm sure, family responsibilities, school responsibilities, but the sooner you can start some of these papers, I think you'll find that they're less stressful and they're more manageable because the directions are pretty clear. And especially when we get into papers four and five in the second half of the semester, you want to try to start them earlier as much as you can so that you can ask me questions that you may have. And also so that way you can check for some of these smaller errors, which are just, again, are very difficult to find um, if you're trying to wrap up very quickly. So again, I'll talk more about that when we get into paper number four on, on John Porcelino in, in a, you know the next couple of weeks. Um, but that's the one piece of advice. And I say that because some, somebody had asked me, well, how can I keep improving? How can I do better on my next paper? And what I always say is, you know, read through the comments I gave on the previous paper, see what I said, see what my the, what you might need to change or be be attentive to in your writing. Um, always read through those directions. That'll help you a lot, particularly when we get to papers four and five, because we're going to be using more sources even for those papers than we did for ones numbers one, two, and three. Uh, and then lastly, like I said, ask for help. So just start as early as you can so that that way you can reach out to me for help. You can make a, uh, an appointment for the Writing Center from, through Harper because all that's online now. They're happy to help you and, and read through a paper before you send it to me. If you want like another opinion beyond mine, that's fine. You know, I encourage you to do that. Uh, I got started, as I probably have told you in other videos, as a writing tutor. That was my first experience of working with other people on their writing as a peer tutor. Um, so I'm a big believer in writing centers and getting um, getting opinions from uh, the tutors that work there because that's how I got my start. And so if I hadn't started as a tutor as an undergrad, I wouldn't gone. I probably wouldn't have gone into teaching. Um, and so for me, that's that's a pretty meaningful profession. And it's it's uh, it, those tutors can really help, um, especially if they're people that are your own age and have done assignments like this and uh, can give you some advice and suggestions. Um, so those are just some suggestions, that, as I said, I have on the midterm. A couple of reminders, like I said, please make sure you pick up the John Porcelino book if you haven't already done so, because we're going to start reading that as soon as we're done with the midterm. Um, and if you have any other questions, let me know uh, and uh, send me an email. And I'll, I hopefully will talk to you then. And um, enjoy the nice weather. I guess it's going to be in the 60s for the next couple of days, although it's, it's still pretty cold here by the lake. Uh, here in Chicago. So we're not, we're not really getting the full benefit. Hopefully where you are, it's a little bit warmer. It doesn't quite feel like 60 degrees today because of the, uh, the breeze coming off the lake. All right. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. Have a good night.